Welcome to the Church of Rock Show, Episode 9, Temple of the Dog, Temple of the Dog. Hello everybody, welcome to the Church of Rock Show, a music history show by a fan for fans. I am your host, Dan Bukowski. Every week I will dive deep into some of the most important, influential, and sometimes simply put, the albums that I have found to be enjoyable, interesting, and that have had a profound effect on my life. I will talk history, dissect lyrics, and the most enjoyable part, I will get into my personal journey with the album. Before we get into this week's episode, please consider visiting the show website at www.churchofrockshow.com. From there, go to the podcast section where each show will have its own page. I will be including some extras I find for each episode, such as rare videos and cool photos from the era for the album being discussed. For you, you can interact with others on the show's Facebook page, at Church of Rock Show, where each episode will have a dedicated post where we can discuss the album and share our personal stories about the music. Also, I will be posting cool and interesting YouTube gems I come across spanning music's vast history. If you find something interesting, please share it with me, and I may use it for a future post. The Instagram page is at Church of Rock Show. Here I'll be sharing what I'm currently listening to, and posting more cool photos from music's vast history. The show can also be followed on Twitter, at Church of Rock 75. You can support the show by telling the music fan in your life about the show. Word of mouth goes a long way, and would be greatly appreciated. If you like what you hear, consider leaving a five-star review for the show on Apple Podcasts. We want to get this content out to as many people as possible, and those reviews go a long way with getting the show to the top of the directories. Also hit the subscribe button to wherever you listen to your podcast to be sure you never miss an episode. Now on to the show. Welcome to the ninth episode of the Church of Rock show. Today's episode, I will be discussing Temple of the Dog's debut and only album, the self-titled Temple of the Dog. Temple of the Dog, the band, and the album can be best described as a labor of love and a beautiful tribute to a friend who passed away at a way too young age. Andrew Wood, the lead singer of Mother Love Bone, died of a heroin overdose on March 19th, 1990, right after, right at the time when the band was really hitting their stride and preparing to make their major label release. Mercury Records, Mother Love Bone's label, wanted to have nothing more to do with the band after the release of the album, and Mother Love Bone would be no more. Stone Gossard and Jeff Ament, a couple of familiar names in the grunge alternative rock scene, were in Mother Love Bone, and more famously they are founding members of Pearl Jam. Early in 1990, though Gossard and Ament are still plotting their next move, and, it, and, it, and in comes Chris Cornell, the lead singer of Soundgarden. Cornell was a roommate of Andrew Woods and a dear friend. Shortly after Woods' death, Cornell would take pen to paper and write a couple of tribute songs titled reach down and say hello to heaven while on a European tour with Soundgarden. The intention was to release these tracks as a single with Cornell playing these tracks with Ahmet on bass and Gossard on rhythm guitar along with Mike McCready on lead guitars and McCready would join Gossard and Ahmet forming Pearl Jam and Soundgarden drummer Matt Cameron who would eventually join Pearl Jam after the disbanding of Soundgarden. Temple of the Dog was formed. As things turned out, Temple of the Dog was not satisfied with just releasing Reach Down and Say Hello to Heaven as a single. Rather, they would write and record a complete album as a unit. Cornell had a backlog of songs written, and some of these songs were reworked by Temple of the Dog and included on the album. Chris Cornell uh, stating in a Rolling Stone interview, I mixed down the two songs I had down on cassettes, and I initially had this idea that maybe as a tribute, I could record them with the band, and it can be a cool as a tribute. Also, it would be cathartic and take up some time because from hour to hour, it was just sort of difficult to deal with. But then I sort of forgot about it. Two weeks later, I ran into Jeff Ahmet somewhere. I can't recall where. He said he heard the songs. He loved them. And he wanted to record them. That made me happy since he had the same idea without me bringing it up. That led to a conversation about making an album since... That's what we did. We didn't really make singles. It was a time where more importance was placed on albums. Then it became cathartic and fun. It became, let's see what songs we have. 
I got three instrumentals from Jeff and Stone that I wrote too. Times of Trouble, For a Walled World, and Pushing Forward Back. There are loose references to Andy in Times of Trouble and maybe for war, in For a Walled World. I wasn't specifically thinking about him as a person. It was more reflecting on how I was feeling at the time. Then Your Savior and All Night Thing were new. That was just me being inspired to write new songs in the same vein I had done with the earlier ones. They didn't feel like they were the same vein as Soundgarden. Temple of the Dog had nine songs for the album, and they needed one more to round everything out. The final piece of the album would be the most popular track on the album, Hunger Strike. There was one more final piece to be added, a second vocalist on on Hunger Strike. That would be Eddie Vedder. In 2019, Eddie Vedder is super well known, but let's go back to late 1990. Pearl Jam doesn't really exist. The band is just coming together, so Eddie Vedder is a complete unknown, but Gossert, Amit, and McCready are starting to form Pearl Jam, and they bring Vedder up to Seattle for a tryout and playing some local gigs with the guys. History shows Vedder gets the job, but his first mainstream work is on Temple of the Dog, where he provides some backing vocals, but more prominently, he's the second lead vocalist on Hunger Strike. Temple of the Dog has some great stories about Vedder, and this is coming from the same Rolling Stone interview. Chris Cornell, we had nine songs for the album that didn't seem complete to me. It seemed like 10 songs was a complete album. I thought Hunger Strike would be a good message to end the album on, but it wasn't complete. It was just one verse. I was singing the chorus in the rehearsal space and Eddie just kind of shyly walked up to the mic and started singing the low, going hungry. And I started singing the high one. When I heard him sing, the whole thing came together in my brain. I just felt like, wow, his voice is so great in this low register. He should sing on it. I'll sing the first verse, then he'll come in. Even though it's the same lyrics, it's a different singer, and it'll feel like two verses. Jeff Ahmed. My memory is that Eddie was just sitting in the corner of the room, writing and drawing in his journal, and keeping himself busy. I think we did those temple sessions after we did the Pearl Jam sessions. There was a vocal part of Hunger Strike, where Chris was trying to jam out in a lot of vocal, and just the way the verse lays out over the chorus, I think Ed just walked up to the mic and sang the other part at, at one point. Chris just said, well, why don't you just sing that part? Mike McCready. Ed was from San Diego, and he felt very intimidated in Seattle. Chris really welcomed him. Ed was super, a super, super shy guy. Chris took him out for beers and told him stories. He was like, hey, welcome to Seattle. I love Jeff and Stone. I give you my blessing. From then, from then on, he was more relaxed. It was one of the coolest things I saw Chris do. Jeff Ahmed. Our, we had our own little incestuous scene. But we were really cynical about what was going on in the rest of the world. We had no idea if the songs would be heard at a big level. But after what happened with Andy, we just didn't have the tools to deal with it. My mom and dad were a thousand miles away. I didn't have anyone around that I was used to talking about stuff with. Making the record really helped the process. It helped us come to terms with losing a friend. Temple of the Dog, as we hear from the most from most of the band, is a bit of an act of therapy for all the individuals on this project was the right place, the right time, and the right people, just being there for one another, creating a great tribute for a friend, and staying busy, and in a way staying relevant to themselves. Jeff Ahmet, I thought I might be done with music, at least at the level of playing the game and trying to be on a major label. I was feeling the pressure of being a 26-year-old that hadn't finished college. There was a pressure from the way I grew up finish something and do it right. There was unfinished business with school, getting my art degree. That summer I went to Western Washington University and kind of looked at the campus and the art facilities. Chris Cornell. I don't really remember doing much else after the funeral other than just being swept up in grief of the moment. But after a couple of weeks, I wrote two songs, Say Hello to Heaven and Reach Down for Andy. I don't remember recording the demos. But I remember the ideas in writing the writing and the lyrics because they were really different and they involved a real person. That wasn't something I'd normally do. I'd normally write a character that was part of me and part of fictional character. But these lyrics specifically reflected Andy and my feelings about him. I didn't let anything else in. It was precious.
The Temple of the Dog sessions happened on various days during November and December of 1990 at London Bridge Studio in Seattle. He also brought in a dedicated producer, Rick Parashar, and Temple of the Dog is his first widely, widely known producing credit. He would go on to produce acts such as Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Blind Melon, and among others. Temple of the Dog also got producing credits on the album. The album was released on April 16th, 1991. It sold approximately 70,000 copies during its first run of the album, and it did not chart. The album did breathe a second life in the mainstream the following year as Soundgarden was getting significant airplay on alternative radio and MTV alternative programming in with their release of their album Bad Motorfinger and Pearl Jam releasing their smash debut 10. a and Records would release Hunger Strike as a single, promoting this as a Soundgarden and Pearl Jam collaboration. Mike McCready on all of this. I didn't feel like it was going to be huge, but I didn't know what huge was. I was just like, wow, I got a record that's on a and I was just super grateful and so happy to be part of it. Chris Cornell. We made one video for Hunger Strike, but we didn't make the rounds, which was very necessary at the time. It wasn't a huge commercial success until the two separate bands emerged with success, successful albums. Somebody at MTV figured that out and started playing the video. The album has since received positive reviews. Uh, All Music staff writer Steve Huey gave the album four and a half out of five stars, saying the album's strength in, in its mournful um, and elegant ballads, but thanks to the band's spontaneous creative energy and appropriately warm sound, it permeated by a definite life-affirming aura. Rolling Stone staff writer David Frick gave Temple of the Dog four out of five stars, saying for Hunger Strike and Reach Down Alone, Temple of the Dog deserves immortality. Those songs are proof that the angst that defined Seattle rock in the 1990s was not cheap and, in the very least, in the beginning. The album opens with Say Hello to Heaven. Again, this is one of the first tracks that Chris Cornell wrote after Andrew Wood's death. And you can definitely tell from these lyrics that this is somebody who's feeling a lot of sadness, who's definitely knee-deep in mourning, but it's also just a great tribute to the friend and the colleague that he lost. And it's just absolutely beautiful. Please, Mother Mercy, take me from this place. In the long-winded curses I hear in my head. And look, at there's, there it is right there. It's the sadness that he's feeling and, and just the pain that he's feeling and, and all the thoughts that are going through his head at the time. The words never listen, and teachers, oh, they never learn. My warmth from my candle, though I feel too cold to burn. He came from an island, and he died from the street. And he hurt so bad, like a soul breaking. But he never said nothing to me, yeah. And now, when you're, we're here, the, the lyrics here, are, we, he came from an island. That's referring to Bainbridge Island in Washington, where Andrew Wood's family had moved to after originating from Mississippi. And then I, I've never been to Bainbridge Island, Washington, but I did do a tad bit of research for this, for this episode. And it, it just seems like a, a very peaceful and beautiful place. And then from there, then he died from the street. And that's, that's the drug culture right there. That's, he didn't literally die in the street, but it, it was the drugs that came from the street that, that just totally just took Andrew Wood's life. And, and then again, the pain that he, that Chris Cornell feels that, that his friend was going through and it was just a, a secretive pain and the drugs that he took were what he had to numb that pain and say hello to heaven, heaven, say hello to heaven. Just that's the finality of it all right there. New like a baby lost like a prayer. The sky was your playground but the cool girl was your bed. And then again, I, I didn't get this too much into the, to the specifics of the death, but I, I do know that uh, Andrew Wood's girlfriend did find him in his apartment uh, when he did pass away. And it's just very well, he could have just been in bed at that time there. So there, there's, the, there's the, the, the words that go along with that. Oh, I said, poor stargazer. She's got no tears in her eyes. 
but full like a whisper. She knows that love heals all wounds with time. And then again, there it is. It's it's the pain the pain that, that he's feeling right now is he knows is is just very strong, but over time he feels like it it will get a little bit better for him. Now it seems now it seemed like too much love is never enough. Yeah, you better seek out another road because this one has ended abrupt. Oh, and again, it's just that, that's the finality of life right there. And then it goes into the course. Say hello to heaven. I, I never wanted to write these words down for you with the pages of phrases of things we'll never do. Yeah, so I blow out the candle and put you to bed. Since you can't say to me now how the dog broke your bone, there's just one left thing to be said. And then he goes into say hello to heaven. And again, that, that's just one of the things, I think especially as a young person, now that this, I mean, this album's almost 30 years old now. I mean, we now that we've we've also lost Chris Cornell tragically as well over the past few years here, and it's it's just so sad to to read these lyrics like like wow this this is a young guy right here talking about a friend who also is very young and he just felt like there was just so much more ahead for all of them and and he's not gonna his friend's not gonna be there to realize that with him so yeah it's just a a, a very 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 tragic end to to the song there and it, it's just really really beautiful now the next track is reach down and i got a lot of positive vibes from reach down I mean, there's a lot of sadness that's going on here with this album but there's just something about reach down and the the words oh within here it's i i actually wrote down a few notes here i i like i feel like this is like the what the the bliss and the the charge and the energy that a performer feels with, uh, with with performing in front of a crowd, and this is them kind of taking a step back and and smelling the roses, so to speak. I had a dream the other night. You were in a bar in the corner on a chair, wearing a long white leather coat, purple glasses and glitter in your hair, and you said, "Hey, this is where I'm going to sit." In buy you a drink someday you were going to the dog shows but you kind of lost your way you say now i got all this room and no money to decorate it so some local customer put me in touch with the man upstairs he said little man you got no business getting frustrated you got you got to rest you got to rest you got to rest and look at and then, there it is going down there in in just taking a moment in in reflecting like yeah okay you've got to you've got this step right here where you're able to buy this place and then unfortunately i mean this is something like i think that that many of us can kind of relate to it's you buy a place whether it's a a house or a condo or whatever and yeah it's a lot of money that you have to put down then then you're just like oh crap (laughs) now now what do we now what do i do next it's kind of like like you have that Again, you have that 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 bliss and that charge of, and that sense of accomplishment of buying that place. But then it's like, all right, now now we got to continue on, and we got to we got to do more. And here's the chorus: I'm in, I'm, I'm going to reach down and pick the crowd up, carry back in your hands to the promised land. I mean, that is just to me that's just crazy electric. Just those words right there. I, I can just imagine just being a lead singer of, of a band, just like even like a guy like Chris Cornell. You, you know the way, the energy that he had in and just looking out to the crowd and just the power that he had in his voice. There's just probably just people just like like in awe, just like in shock and just just so happy. And and he knows, he knows that that he has the crowd eating out of his hands there. It's just crazy crazy to even imagine anything like that especially from somebody like me who again i'm just a fan i'm not a musician i've never been a musician just knowing what that feeling is life just 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 gotta be crazy now i had some angel shine my wings she said nothing but the best for the golden boy she made me promise not to tell i had her under spell singing golden words in a broken voice and I caught some blessing on the wind. I'm feeling lighter than the breath from a dove. I've got no hands to tie behind my back. 
and I'm sparking like a heart attack. Now I've got room to spread my wings and my messages of love. Yes, love was my drug, but that's not what I died of. So don't think of me crying louder than some billion dollar baby. I want to rest. I want to rest. Reach down and pick the crowd up. Carry me back in my hand to the promised land. Now there's, there's a songwriter's reason for being right there. They're doing what they love and performing the music that they love. And that is what really sparks them. Love. Yes, that was my drug, but that's not what I died of. It's almost like, all right, I, you're talking about somebody who had this profession, uh, their labor of love, their able, their work was their love, but then the work brought them money. And with that money, they were, they went and bought the drugs that eventually killed them. So it's almost kind of like this weird dichotomy going on there. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the work that I absolutely love, but then just the outcomes of what, what came from that work and the people that you may have been around that weren't the greatest of influences at the start. And then the money that you earn and then the gifts that are given to you and, Maybe even some of these gifts were drugs, and that's just what ultimately kills somebody. It's just, just uh, again, you're talking about, this is a rock and roll tragedy, really is what what this is all about. And Reach Down really encompasses that. You get the high, you get the real highs of the performance, and then eventually the low of death. Amazing, amazing track. The next track in the album, Hunger Strike. To me, this is a track that stands alone. It's different from them. It's, it's more of a song of political nature. It's a middle finger to power and empathy to those who are going about the necessities to live. And as I was going through the history of the album here, this was the final piece of this album here. And it is kind of like an outlier. And if you really thought, okay, is there a song off here that's really, truly single? Well, yeah, Hunger Strike for sure fits the bill because it it wasn't created with the other nine. So it definitely does stand alone. And again, this is, it's, it really is an amazing song, but it just, to me, it, it doesn't seem like it, it fits the themes to the rest of the album. But hey, if you're going to, if you need to fill out an album, there's really not a bad there's really not a, a worse way to do it than with Hunger Strike. I mean, you got Chris Cornell and Eddie Vedder on vocals. Absolutely amazing, amazing stuff. That, and and it just they're they're two they're just two different vocal ranges completely, but it works so beautifully. Let's get into the let's get into the lyrics here. I don't mind stealing bread from the mouths of decadence, but I can't feed on the powerless when my cup's already overfilled. Like like he knows. <clears throat> Chris Cornell is with, with his, his lyrics here. He, he just knows he's like, wow, I've, I've got a, I've got a lot here more than probably he ever imagined. And, and you got to figure, okay, these, these guys, like, like they've, I would say the Soundgarden guys at, at this point, they, they haven't reached their peak yet, but we're the Pearl Jam guys. And their, their debut was, was a total, total wild success, but Chris Cornell probably has more than, than what he ever imagined. So it's, it, it's like, you know, my cup's already overfilled. So I'm getting ready to share this with, with other people. Yeah, but it's on the table. The fire is cooking in the farming babies while the slaves are working. The blood is on the table. The mouths are choking, but I'm going hungry. And then it, it go and it just, again, it just repeats that. So the first part of the song there, Chris Cornell doing his vocals and then, it's just a, a a repeat on the next with Eddie Vedder taking over the, the lead vocals. And then at the end of the song, there's just an interplay between the two. Just absolutely, absolutely amazing stuff. As I said, more of a more of a political stance taking on here. It's 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 a almost kind of talking about an abuse of power and abuse of wealth in in many ways where uh, Chris Cornell's like, all right, you know, here I am a, a guy who is doing very well for himself, but he's not like 
completely disgustingly rich by any stretch of the imagination. But he's also saying like, hey, I know I have enough here. I'm ready to share. And there's all these other people who are way, way, way more than I have. And they're just keeping it all for themselves. It's, it's He's talking about the, the selfish acts of, of others there with, with, the, with the track. Absolutely great song. Great, great stuff. Next song, Pushing Forward Back. Now, this one here I, I can definitely say is, is about addiction and what goes on with families of those who have loved ones that have an addiction. And this is also talking about being rejected by loved ones or loved ones being on their last ropes, kind of putting their, their arms up in the air and saying, all right, you know, I've, I've done so much here. I just don't know what else more I can do. Mother, mother found me on her step. Gracious mother held me to her breast until the day I started pushing. Too late to cry, she turned away. I started pushing. I saw no future in this lack. I started pushing, pushing forward back. Now to me, as a parent, that is a very, very sad visual that's going on there because uh, as, a, as a parent, you, you, you just have, you have your children as babies and you hold them and you protect them and and there's just sometimes, again, I've talked about this in, in other episodes of the podcast too, when we're talking about self-awareness of, of drug use and drug addiction, that the visual of a parent and a child, no matter how old they are, and the parent's still trying to do everything that they possibly could do for the child, and it just seems like nothing is, is helping out the situation just really, it's really gut wrenching stuff to me personally. And I, I don't know if anybody else really feels that way, but it, even if you don't have kids, I mean, just, I mean, just picture that going on, just picture a mother with a young child. And then like all of a sudden, okay, they're in their early twenties and then they've kind of gone down this, this other path. And it just it brings a lot of sadness. Baby brother clinging to her hair. Gracious mother pleading, not another soul to bear. He started pushing. All my kings have fallen down. I started pushing. Fallen heroes feed the ground. Now, this is another level of sadness because, I mean, we've seen this happen before. It's almost kind of like like a like an influence type of thing. Um, I, I think a lot of times I, when you're talking about going down um, the dark path, of drug addiction many times it's okay I'm like like more of like like a like a social you know pure type of situation but can you imagine if this was a sibling type of situation for a parent having multiple children going through through this and this is her okay like mother pleading not another soul to bear she's like like oh crap i'm going through this all over again I don't know how much more I can do this. And then it's just going into the, into the chorus. I was pushing, pushing forward back. And then again, that's the tug of war that, that goes on with addiction. There's highs and there's lows. There's people that go and get the help. They have a temporary cure for, for the dependency that they do have on the drug. And then sometimes they end up going back and that's the pushing forward back this whole thing. It's almost, again, I, I've, I've even described this before in, in other shows too, where it's the, the two shoulder thing going on there. You got the angel on one shoulder and you got the devil on the other shoulder. It's like, okay, you know, you want, you know what, what the right thing is to do to follow the angel, but then the devil just brings so much temptation uh, to, to you. And, and unfortunately with this, <laughs> with, with this album here, it, it's, it's a tribute to, to a fallen friend. And I really see, I can really see the association here with, with the addiction part here, um, with pushing forward back. The next track is call me a dog. And I just have one note on this one here. I found this to be a fight with a significant other. This, this track here, you call me a dog. Well, that's fair enough because it ain't no use to pretend you're wrong. You call me out. I can't hide anymore. I have no disguise you can see through. You say it's bad luck to have fallen for me. What can I do to make it good for you? 
You wore me out like an old winter coat, trying to be safe from the cold. But when it's time to throw in throw the next stone, I call you beautiful. If I call you at all, you call me a dog. Now, this right here, I'm taking this from the perspective that the the writer is a male who is being called a dog from from a female here, and he knows that he's like, like almost kind of like, like a like a like a piece of shit in 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 many ways, but. He, the only thing that he has to say back is like, like, yeah, I know I'm, I'm messing up here, but you're beautiful. But then she's, then she just goes, you call me a dog and you tell me I'm low. Cause I slept on the floor and out in the woods with the badgers and wolves. You threw me out cause I went digging for gold and I came home with a handful of coal. Now that one there, I just... Like I have now, that's one part I'm having a struggle with here. You threw me out because I went digging for gold. Is that to me? I I know like like you hear a lot of stories, especially in the music industry, where I mean, really to get yourself going, it's it's a grind and it's a lot of work. And there's just sometimes where the other person in the relationship can't handle all the time that's being dedicated to to the work and to the craft and that's almost kind of like like where where i'm going with that one then and it goes i came home with a handful of coal it's it's almost like like all right say you make it you get you get all the riches in the world you get all the fame in the world but then at the end of the day you come home that person's gone or they want to be gone so you almost feel like you're emotionally bankrupt at that time. No, even though you have, you have a full wallet that's bursting at the seams with money. But at the end of the day, what you really want is that love and compassion from your significant other. And then they've had enough. So then they have nothing left. But when it's time to throw the next stone, I call you beautiful. If I call at all. And when it's my time to call your bluff, I call you beautiful or leave it alone. Yeah, you call me a dog. Well, that's fair enough. It doesn't bother me. As long as you know, the bad luck will follow you. If you keep me on a leash and you drag me along. If you keep me on a leash, you drag me along. Absolutely stunning stuff going on there. It's, it's, it's a lot of self-awareness that's going on there with the writer. Um, and it's, it's almost kind of sad in a lot of ways. And it, it's truly, truly a great song. The next song is Times of Trouble. To me, this is a message of hope. Masking your troubles with substances are not the answer. The high is only temporary. When the spoon is hot and the needle sharp, and you drift away, oh, oh, I can hear you say that the world in black is upon your back and your body shakes, so you ditch away and you close the shades. Don't try to do it. Don't try to kill your time. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, you might do it. Then you can't change your mind. You've got to hold on to your time till you break through these times of trouble. When you try to talk and the words get hard and they put you down, don't they, don't you say, don't you ditch away? I saw you swinging. Yeah. Swinging your mother's sword. Oh, I know you're playing. Sometimes the rules get hard, but if somebody left you out on a ledge, if somebody pushed you over the edge, you got to hold on your time till you break through these times of trouble. Yeah, again, this is this is to me it's a it's a temporary high. Um, n nothing really much more to more to say on here. It's just really, really a, another powerful statement being made by Chris Cornell. Uh, another well well written song uh, here. It's absolutely tremendous. The next song is "Wooden Jesus." I feel that this is a song about religion and how it's used as a tool 
and the exploitation from from re- some religious leaders and and having uh, using religion for monetary exploitation. Uh, to me, this holds true. This is something that that can happen in all faiths, not just one specifically. And there are snakes everywhere. Wouldn't Jesus? Where are you from? Korea or Canada or maybe Taiwan? I didn't know it was the Holy Land, but I believed from the minute the check left my hand and I pray. Look at, I mean, I almost sometimes I, I when I think of this stuff and and I know it's not as prevalent, maybe just because I watch a, a lot less TV nowadays, is going back to the '90s and how prevalent the those um, TV preachers were at the time there and just how charismatic and influential those guys could be and the check left my hand and I pray. So, I mean, that, that has to apply to so many people where they just see this, this really influential person is like, like here, take all my money, it, cure all, cure all my pain. And now going back to the, to the drug songs, it's, you can almost kind of see a parallel between those two is that people are looking for happiness. Some people are looking for, for happiness and to relieve the pain through substances. Other people are doing it to ease their mind when it comes to being part of a group or through faith-based practice. Can I be saved? I spent all my money on a future grave. Wouldn't Jesus, I'll cut you in on 20% of my future sin. Whew. Wow. <laughs> that's just, that's just crazy. And, and going like, just looking at, again, I spent all my money on a future grave. Now that's, and there, there's a reality going on there. And think about how much money it costs when somebody does pass away. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. The bill that's left, whether it's from a funeral home or buying a, a plot in a, and it uh, to bury somebody. It's just a funeral plot. Just crazy. It, it's it's really crazy. Porcelain Mary, Her Majesty's pure, looking for virgin territory. Coat hanger halos don't come cheap from television shepherds with living room sheep. And I pray. And again, look at Porcelain Mary. That's just another great visual that's going on there. They're looking. It's it's like you have this. Think think of a, a vision of the Virgin Mary, just a very peaceful visual there, and then it can almost be kind of turned around and kind of used to manipulate people if if they're vulnerable. And when you're looking from the tev- the television shepherds with living room sheep, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for vulnerable people to take their money. Can I be saved? I spent all my money on a future grave. Wouldn't Jesus? I'll cut you in on twenty percent of my future sin. Wow. There's, you know, like there's there's a lot of anger going on here. It's again, let's take a look at this. There's even some parallels here with with hunger strike. Okay, we're looking at at pe- it all comes down to money, right? We have people with a lot of money who are not willing to share it, and then you also have the people here that are looking to take money from people, and then unfortunately, the people that are the most vulnerable are the people that are just getting by and every extra cent that they have, they're giving it to, to these preachers and they're just being manipulated. And, and that's what Chris Cornell is trying to get at there. The next track is your savior. And I have here, it's, it's a, it's a song of being told what to believe and how to live your life from somebody else. People like you, I know myself walk in the shoes of somebody else. Whisper to me, my tragic fate, my tragic end, but don't give me your savior. People I choose, life on my own. Burn me your fuse, throw me your stones. Give me your brand, burn on my hand. Whisper to me my tragic end, but don't give me your savior. People I choose, I know myself. Lay my need out, give you my help, but you give me your blues and you whisper my fate, but don't give me your savior. Again, it comes down to he doesn't want he doesn't want your savior. Um, he doesn't he doesn't want what you're trying to sell him. 
He just wants to live the life that he wants to, to lead. And finally, we get into, it's not actually not finally, what am I, it's, we're getting into Four Walled World. And this is a song that I feel like is being trapped in your own mind or in a situation that you don't know how to get out of. Well, she cried and she cried all night to the sound of the freeway hum. And she swears she'll be gone when the sun hits the ground and she ain't coming back to my cell. When she's tired and she's tired of this life she's been leading too long. And the time turns around through the walls that surround to the chimes of a jailer song. And then again, I, we're talking about, okay, for world world, that, something that, that you hear about jail. Okay. Like, Oh, you're trapped around these four walls. But again, we're going back to your own mind. You can also be a prisoner of your own mind. And this is not to be taken into a literal sense. This is more of a figurative sense here. And that's where you're trying to get at here. Yeah, she tries and she tries, but my feet, they just won't leave the ground. And I'm tired. I'm tired of this prisoner's life and these chains that drag me down. And again, it's, I, I'm almost kind of associating this, all this that's going on here within this track is, as addiction. It's, they're looking for, they're looking for an exit. They're looking for a release, even if it's just temporary. They're just tired of what's going on in their mind and just looking for something else to, to help, help things through, to help them get through the day. Well, she cried and she cried all night to the sound of the freeway hum and she swears she'll be gone when the sun hits the ground and she ain't no she ain't coming back from my cell now the sun is low these walls try to break my soul now the moon is full and i won't see nothing tonight but the tear in her eyes in my four yeah in my four my four walled world this is one of those things when you're talking about pain and depression no matter what the time of day is, it just, just doesn't go away. And, and again, this is when you're getting the visuals of the sun and the moon. This is really driving home the point of this is a 24-hour thing that's going on here in the four-walled world. Now, we are going to get to the final track, which is All Night Thing. And I get two mixed messages from this song. I get it either be talking about a one night stand or a death from an overdose. Two completely different things going on here. Let's see if we can make some sense of this. Now, this is one I would love to hear some other people's perspectives on here and, and see what, what you're feeling when, it, when you hear all night thing. She motioned to me that she wanted to leave and go somewhere warm where we'd be alone. I do not know what's going on, but I'm guessing it's an all-night thing. If it's an all-night thing, nobody's going to make it end, and it doesn't begin. Don't worry that I'll, I'll that offense. And if it's an all-night thing, and we fall like a tear falling to the ground, I'll never come around, and you'll never hear a word from me if that's an all-night thing. Again, there's, if anything, there's nothing else. There's finality being talked about here, whether it's you're never going to see me again because I'm no longer on this earth or this is just us having one night together. And that's the conflict that I'm having with this, with this song myself. I walked along feeling at ease in falling like rain into her scheme she won't let on what that will be, but I'm guessing it's an all-night thing. If it's an all-night thing, nobody's going to make it end. And if it doesn't begin, don't worry that I'll take offense. And if it's an all-night thing and we fall like a tear falling to the ground, I'll never come around. And you'll never hear a word from me if it's an all-night thing. tremendous tremendous way to end the to end the album it's a great closing track great album front to back 
Those are the tracks. Now let's get into this album upon its initial release in 1990. The thing only sold 70,000 copies, and I'm not going to be one to admit that I was one of those first 70,000. In fact, I was not familiar with this album at all until Hunger Strike became a hit on alternative in the alternative music scene and after Pearl Jam 10 was released. I did get Pearl Jam 10 when it first did get released just from the just from the airplay that it was getting on alternative radio and also from MTV and that, that was a that was an album I was definitely hooked to. But to say that I had anything from Soundgarden at that time I didn't, I didn't, I didn't listen to any Soundgarden, uh, prior to Temple of the Dog. So I had no exposure to them. Uh, Soundgarden was one of those, was one of those bands. That, yeah. They were played on alternative radio every once in a while, but then you also got to remember too, when we're talking about radio they're they have, they want to get people to listen to, to their station. So it, it was kind of like, like no different than what, what you would say, like what top 40 radio is like today, you were going to get the, you were going to get the major hits. You were going to get your Pearl Jams. You were going to get your Alice in Chains, your Smashing Pumpkins uh, and other, other uh, uh, bands that were, that had smash hits at that time on the alternative scene where Soundgarden really didn't hit that stride yet once we're talking about going back to 1991. So my first exposure to the work of Chris Cornell uh, was this. And then eventually I did get into Soundgarden after that. And I bought the album, I want to say probably like around 1992. Um, that would probably be more along the lines. I was in, I was a junior in high school at that time going into my senior year. So I did have the album on CD at that point. And when I was going through my music library at this time, there was a moment in time where I did do a purge <laughs> of stuff. And for whatever reason, I purged this album out of my collection. Like I just don't get it. Um, what was going through, what was going through my mind at the time. So I, I went ahead and, and I actually rebought the album now to have it in, in my library. It's just one of those, one of those ones that I definitely had to have. Um, but yeah, I was, I was kind of shocked, but at this point I do listen to this album quite often on Spotify. It's, it's definitely in heavy rotation, Listening, listening to it front to back, uh, I'm probably listening to it front to back a lot more today than I did back in 1992. And back then, I'm I'm just I'm a kid just trying to accumulate as as much as possible. And yeah, I'm probably listening to Hunger Strike and Say Hello to Heaven a lot more uh, just because yeah, that's what's popular and that's what's kind of going through my mind. But now as I've, as I've grown up and learning about the story of this album, this is just, just really heart wrenching stuff. Uh, this was, this is a, an album to me. Like I look at literally as a form of therapy for a group of young men who lost a friend and now being the age of 44, going back and, and thinking about that. It's like, like, like there was just a lot of there's just a lot of tragic deaths that were going on with uh, with some of the, the alternative artists at that time. And, and Andrew Wood was one of them. Um, now, when it comes to Mother Love Bone, I never owned an album by them. I will be the first to admit I I've heard of them uh, prior to because you. Well, yeah, the story of Pearl Jam at the time was all right. These are these are guys that were from the former Mother Love Bone, essentially putting a band together, and they really didn't even get too much into Eddie Vedder's story. But but now, like I I do listen to Mother Love Bone a lot more uh, just because I have access to the album. It's probably one of those albums I probably would have eventually bought, but I never did uh, at the time, so I really wasn't 
too familiar with, with Andrew Wood's work. I mean, I heard the name when it came from Temple of the Dog because it did come up saying, I mean, especially when it came to the track, say hello to heaven, that's, you can definitely tell that's, that's a track that's about somebody and the name would come up and it was almost kind of, it was almost kind of tragic in a way. When I, when I look back at it, it's like, man, could, could we have found more time to play mother love bone a little bit more on alternative radio or on MTV after temple of the dog was released just because that's what the influence was. But then again, it comes, it all comes down to, who's in charge and what they feel like is the musical taste at the time. And, and I would say mother love bone is not the most is not, I wouldn't say it's not accessible music, but it's not anything accessible. Like what's off of Pearl jam 10 or even what's off of temple of the dog. So to me, that almost seems like a missed opportunity. And I would hope that, what comes out of this episode is that not only will uh, others go into listening to temple of the dog again and kind of take a listen to it from a different perspective. If you never really thought too, too closely about what the themes of the album were, but then also take the time to go listen to mother love bone and go listen to Andrew Wood's work. Um, here go to where the inspiration was to this particular album it, it's really good stuff and i think you'll all be pleasantly surprised thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the church of rock show i appreciate all the support i'm receiving for the show please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to your podcasts the show is available on apple podcasts spotify google play stitcher and podbean and the show notes page on the website. If there's another platform you use, please share this with me, and I will get the show there too. I'm working on getting the audio version of the show available on YouTube. There are a few episodes at this time, so please go ahead and do a search of The Church of Rock Show and find the page, as the show has not reached its YouTube minimums to give it a proper web address. So please like the page so we can get the numbers up to accomplish this. Share the show with a friend. Word of mouth goes a long way to grow the show. Visit the show at churchofrockshow.com and check out the show notes underneath the podcast section of the site for bonus materials such as videos, photos, and direct links to listen to the albums on Spotify and Apple Music. Also check us out on the social media on Facebook and Instagram at Church of Rock Show and on Twitter at Church of Rock 75. The episode is brought to you by Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash Church of Rock. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash Church of Rock for your free audiobook. You can link directly to the show's sponsored Audible page by visiting churchofrockshow.com and go to the support section and click on the Audible link and you can get your subscription started there as well. Until next time, I will catch you again for another episode of The Church of Rock Show.